Sherry Peel Jackson. She is an ex-IRS agent, uh, CPA, fraud examiner. She was working for the IRS. She was on a fast track to success there. She was doing very well, had received numerous awards for all of the work she did. And she realized that there is no law and that the biggest fraud was the IRS. I tried to be the best at whatever I did. So when I got to the IRS, I hit the ground running. My first year in 1988, I got a fraud award. It's a big shaped in Georgia award for fraud. But I got numerous awards, and my biggest one is from the IRS commissioner himself back in uh, 1995. It was Fred T. Goldberg. One of the things that I wanted to tip you off on as far as what the IRS does before I get into the story, they have, well, they had, I don't know what they're doing now, but they had what's called a market segment specialization program, or MSSP. They would take different market segments, like ministers, and try to figure out how much money you were underreporting. Let's take beauticians, for example. I'm going to audit her beauty shop. She owns the shop and she has some people working there. Based on the assumption that the IRS has that people don't report all of their money, but they like to put all their expenses on there. So granted, all her expenses are on the tax return, and I figure out how many bottles of this and that she bought. I can calculate a dollar figure. So I'll tell Sophia, after it's all over and we're buddy-buddy, I, I just shock her. And I said, well, guess what? Uh, it looks like, based on my calculation, that you really brought in $80,000, but you have 50 on the tax return. So here, you have to owe the, you owe the IRS back $30,000. What would she do? She was shot. She would sign off on it. I only had two cases in seven and a half years where, where somebody actually bucked at me. People are so afraid. The, the government and the media have gotten you guys so afraid of the IRS that you don't even buck them. Now, mind you, she might have left some money off. Maybe there was several times where she just didn't report the cash. And maybe that's why. Maybe she, didn't even have, she has no idea how much she quote-unquote underreported. Maybe that was it. But they always acquiesce. They got one, anybody own a laundromat, they have one that will calculate, based on your water bill, how many loads were washed at your laundromat? And the point to all of this is, this is what they do to people, and people just acquiesce to it. When I quit the IRS in 1995, and after maybe a year of being Jim Cleaver and realizing that that was just not me, I hung my shingle, which, which in accounting terms or business terms is you, you start your own business. Now, you know that picture of Uncle Sam, the one that says Uncle Sam wants you? I used that same picture, and I, and I had it really big, and I says, Uncle Sam wants your money. But I'm a former IRS agent. I'm going to show you how to get it back. You know, the people came running. And then these people start coming to me saying, <clears throat> uh, I keep hearing that uh, we're not supposed to pay tax. Or I keep hearing that the tax law is a fraud. And like I said, I was raised differently. I never would look at that person and say, you're a cuckoo. I wouldn't even think it. It was like, okay, you know, in, in this back burner back here, I would think to myself, okay, there's some people out there that actually think that the income tax doesn't apply to us or it's a fraud or it's being misapplied. But I didn't do anything about it because, remember, I'm rolling around with my little businesses and whatnot. So one night in, uh, maybe in early June, one of my pastor clients called. It was night. It was about 9 o'clock at night. And she said, you know what? I think it was maybe a Wednesday night after her Wednesday night service. She said, uh, I've got this par parishioner that just keeps bugging me about this income tax. She's talking about that we're not liable for the income tax, and she wants to talk to you. Can I give this lady your telephone number? And I said, uh, okay. So maybe about 10 minutes later, this lady called me. She said, uh, I have a question for you. Are we supposed to pay income tax or not? And I said, okay. Do you want the cuff answer or do you want the real answer? She said, I want the real answer. I said, well, I really don't know. You know, even though I'm a former IRS agent, I haven't done the research, but I hear that there's a credible body of evidence out there that says that we don't owe income tax. I was okay. I mean, I took the information. I was sitting there listening like, okay, okay, okay. And, you know, I said, okay, this lady had a lot of information. I don't know where she got it from. So a few weeks later, she called me again, and she said, Miss Jackson, Miss Jackson, remember that information I told you on the phone? It's in the USA Today. Pull it up on the Internet. Okay, so I got the USA Today. It was July 7th, 2000. And it says, Dear We the People, Most citizens are not required to file an income tax return. The 16th Amendment to the Constitution is a fraud. And if you file, you waive your Fifth Amendment right. I said, okay, that's another stuff she was saying. Now, this is a lot of reading. But I kept reading because I was very interested, you know, being a CPA and into fraud and all that. I wanted to see what was going on. So here in the third column, it says no one has been able to collect the $50,000 reward offered by Bill Conklin 
to anyone that can identify the section of the Internal Revenue Code that makes a typical worker liable for the income tax. I'm serious about winning is fifty thousand dollars. Okay, so it's at my desk. Basically, I just shoved everything off my desk and got the codes out, the regulations out, the tax guide. I got on the internet to look at the Cornell University site, all these different things, and I started researching. And two weeks later, I said to myself, oh, my goodness, we have a problem here. It doesn't look like I'm going to win this money. <laughs> and I was sitting there at my desk thinking, this, is, this thing is a fraud. Two weeks it took me to sit there and, and, and realize that. I didn't just look at the positive. I looked at the negative. I looked at the IRS site. All these things are going on. This thing is a fraud. Being, being a CPA and a former IRS agent, I sat there at the desk, and I was by myself, and all these thoughts started going, going through my head. The first thought was, now I finally open up the codes and regulations. Because, see, at the IRS, they trained us with these little guides. We didn't use the codes and regulations. We would get one of these, and you would have to read it, understand it, and pass this little test. And all these little guys that I got, I read them, and I, I made A's on all my tests. And I thought, and I guess the rest of the agents in training thought that the information that was in here was the same that was in those thick codes and regulations. But it's not necessarily the same. The things that are in these training manuals are not necessarily the same things in the codes and regulations. I learned that in my studying. And the time that I was doing the research, I also learned about the pocket commission. Now, I'm going to let this go around the room, but y'all got to give it back. This is the outside that I purchased of the pocket commission that I had. And before I left, I had the sense of mind to make a copy. This is the little badge I used to flip out at people and say, give me your books and records. Give me your bank statements. Give me all your credit cards, you know. And, you know, people, okay, here, you know, even the counties. I go to the county, do it. I go just about anywhere and flip this little thing out and get whatever I want, you know. There's a lot of power nuts out there doing that, guys. Y'all know it. Half of you already know about it. There's an enforcement pocket commission, and there's a non-enforcement pocket commission. And I started looking back at this thing. It has SER, Southeast Region. First of all, I'll read it. It has my picture up here, and it says, uh, Sherry Jackson, whose signature and picture appear above, is duly commissioned as internal revenue agent and has authority to perform all duties conferred upon such officers under all laws and regulations administered by the Internal Revenue Service, including the authority to investigate and require and receive information as to all matters relating to such laws and regulations. And it has SER and some other numbers and an A. And based on this Internal Ma Revenue Manual, A means administrative. So I'm an administrative clerk out there on the front lines. And I'm an administrative clerk with a non-enforcement pocket commission. Okay, so I'm starting to get angry here. Starting to think about all the, I had to take bribes and get little tape recorders taped to my body and, and the little microphones on me and go in and take bribes from people. But, you know, thinking about stuff like that, you know, what, they got me out here and I'm thinking I really have authority. And this is administrative, administrative, non-enforcement pocket commission. That was one of the other things I thought about. And then I thought about and I found out this is, this is one of the, another issue, a levy versus a notice of levy. This is something that I didn't deal with a lot because I was an agent and I just assessed the tax. I, didn't, I wasn't a tax collector. I just assessed it. So this is a notice of levy. And someone said, hey, this is a notice of levy. This is what the banks get or your, your job or whatever. They said, look at the back of it. So I'm looking at the back of this notice of levy and it says section 6331, levy and distraint. And then it says B. And C. And I'm thinking, it starts off with B? What happened to A? So I looked up A. And here's A. And it says, levy may be made upon the accrued salary or wages of any officer, employee, or elected official of the United States, the District of Columbia, or any agency or instrumentality of the United States or the District of Columbia by serving a notice of levy. I'm thinking, but that's not most people. That's not the person that works at AT&T or Bell South, or Coca-Cola. That's not most people. Aren't people noticing that the A isn't on here? Aren't they, aren't they curious about it? Why are they doing this? So all this is going through my head during this period of time that I'm realizing that there's, there's a rat in the camp. That's what I call it. But this is the, the straw that broke the camel's back. The Federal Reserve is not federal. How many of you did not know before today that the Federal Reserve isn't federal? If you didn't, don't be shy. If you didn't know before today that the Federal Reserve isn't federal, raise your hand. Most people don't know that. Nine out of ten people that I ask off the street don't understand that the Federal Reserve is a non-auditable private banking cartel. They 
are collecting six million dollars an hour in interest from the American people. Thirty-six million dollars an hour in interest from the American people. My children, my two children, were born $86,000 in debt based on the national debt. Now why am I going to take away from those children to give to somebody that is going to be born in 2030? That's not going to happen. So that was my decision. It was very easy. You know, you think about stuff like fear. Oh, the IRS is going to get you. They're going to take your stuff. It, that's not important to me. Stuff's not important to me. My children are important to me. I'm one of those mothers that will roll up her sleeves with one leg and try to whoop you if you mess with my children. And I think that a lot of mothers are like that. So this is what my decision was. And I went on and started educating people. One of the things that people ask me once I've made this decision and started talking about it, how are we going to run the country without the income tax? I don't know how much Dan got into it, but the Grace Commission report that Ronald Reagan put out in 1994, 84, sorry, says that none of the money collected in income tax goes towards running the country. But the bottom line is it's not going towards running the country, so you patriotic people out there, you've been fooled. Beardsley Rummel, he was Federal Reserve Chairman back in 1946, did a speech before the American Bar Association. The title of his speech was Taxes for Revenue Are Obsolete. Within the body of this report, he says that the taxes, the income taxes for redistribution of wealth, what is redistribution of wealth? What is that? That's taking from me that I've worked hard for and given it from somebody else to somebody else. Shouldn't I have the right to redistribute my wealth if I want to? Another question that they ask me is, how come I haven't heard this on TV <laughs> or on the radio or in the newspaper? Well, sweetie, the simple answer to that is the same people who own the television stations and the newspapers and the radio stations are the same people who are involved with the Federal Reserve. And here is a little statement that says that it only requires 5% ownership to significantly influence the media. Rockefeller is one of the original shareholders of the Federal Reserve. Uh, as early as 1963, the House Banking Subcommittee reported that Rockefeller, through Chase Manhattan Bank, controlled 5.9% of the stock in CBS and the bank and gained interlocking directorates with ABC. I went all the way through high school, all the way through college, all the way through testing for the CPA, and all this Irish training and didn't hear about any of this. You think they want this information out here? For you guys to eat up and chew up and find out what's really going on? I don't think so. Now, another one. Why, why don't we just tell our elected officials about this? <sighs> and to make a really long story short, the We the People Foundation, the same people that put out this ad, put together a hearing. And these 40 researchers we're going to ask the IRS and the DOJ these questions, and we're going to have this big meeting in Washington called the Truth and Taxation Hearings, okay? So we got together with 537 questions. So we sent them the 537 questions so they could research and have the answers, and what did they do? They reneged on coming. They signed off on it, but they reneged on coming. So you all didn't get to hear the truth. We went on and had the hearings anyway, put it on CD, marched around Washington, giving it to all 535 congressmen and senators. Please look at this information. We got stupid responses back like, thank you for visiting our offices in Washington. The next time you come from Washington, come to Washington, please visit us again. They don't care. Your presidents don't care. Another one that they ask me, or they'll say something like, well, this just sounds like it's some kind of conspiracy theory. Y'all hear that a lot? Okay. But tell me this, what's the difference between a conspiracy and a strategy? Don't you understand that this is all by design? All this black, white stuff. You're white, I'm black, you know. You're Democrat, I'm a Republican. You know, y'all heard of divide and conquer before, right? Yeah. Why y'all letting, letting them do it to us? While I'm sitting up here arguing with this man about what his great, great, great granddaddy did to mine, there's this big old fence closing in around us. And while I'm sitting here wasting time and he's sitting here telling me why he doesn't know, we need to put our heads together and figure out how to get out of this fence that these people are building around us. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what we got to be. <laughs> Divide and conquer, we can't let that work anymore. It's been working all these years. Then we need to get together and understand. First of all, you need to understand what is going on with your money. You work hard. It's like we're on a hamster. We are a hamster on a wheel. This country started out with taxation without representation. Where are we now? How, why did we get back to where we started? We got lazy and comfortable. Get out your comfort zone. 
I never tell people to file a tax return. I never tell them not to file. I never tell people to pay taxes, and I never tell them not to pay. What I tell people is to do your own research, do your due diligence, and decide whether or not you're going to be a slave or get off the plantation. That's your choice. So in essence, you're wasting time. As long as you continue to feed the monster, the monster's going to grow. They're going to always have, they're going to laugh in your face. And any kind of calls that you have, anything that you're trying to do in your life concerning getting things back on track with our country the way it's supposed to be, you're going to get laughed at because you continue to give them the money to do whatever it is they're doing to us. A lot of people don't care. A lot of people get the money taken out of their checks and they actually think they're getting, oh, I get back $3,000 every year. They don't take anything from me. I say, sweetie, look at your W-2. They took $14,000. They gave you back $3,000 of your own money. Oh. <laughs> but the point is, if each of us understands where we are, who we are, and tries to do something about it, then we're going to get somewhere. This is a great country, but it's off track. And who's going to get it back on track? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all.